Thank you, Professor Uma. Namaskar. Good afternoon here in India. On behalf of Central Institute of Indian Languages, Mysuru, it is an honor and privilege to welcome Professor Jose Lambert, Professor Emeritus at KU Leuven, Belgium, for today's talk. Uh, my esteemed colleagues at CIL and all online participants, participants from Morrison. Uh, we are gathered here to listen to Professor Rose Lambert's on the topic, Turning Points in Translation and Communication, the Challenges of Internationalization. So I welcome you, sir, to this 53rd Foundation Day Lecture Series organized by Central Institute of Indian Languages today. This is the 30th lecture in this series, and I thank Professor Kuma for organizing such an event and also inviting Professor Jose Lambert to deliver a talk on this occasion. It is indeed a real privilege for all of us to listen to you, sir. As we know, translation is more than just changing the words from one language to another. Translation builds bridges between cultures. It allows us to experience other culture phenomena, other cultural artifacts that would otherwise be too foreign and remote to grasp through our own cultural lens. In a way, in a sense, translation is the future and it is the way forward. In this context, I would like to mention that Central Institute of Indian Languages, through a scheme named called National Translation Mission, is engaged actively in translating and publishing higher education texts and other teaching materials which are available in English into all the scheduled languages of India, that is 22 in numbers, thereby paving the way for creating an inclusive knowledge society. So this topic that the turning points in translation and communication is a great interest to all of us. It is indeed a real privilege for all of us to listen to Professor Joseph Lambert on this occasion. Once again, we are thankful to you, sir, for sharing your valuable time with us. And I also welcome our teacher, friends, colleagues, and the participants from Morris's to this talk. Namaskar, sir. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Professor Shalendra Mohan. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a great privilege and honor to introduce Professor Jose Lambert. I'm very happy and glad that we have our founder director, Professor D.P. Patnaik, with us today. Jose and uh, Devi Prasanna Patnaik are contemporary scholars, 1941 born and 1943 born. So we have 1941 born is uh, Jose and we have 1931 born is our Professor Patnaik. I'm very happy to have two stalwarts uh, with us. And uh, as most of you know, the name Lambert is known in translation studies. All of us who did masters in linguistics have read his works. As you know very well, he is 82 years now, and he is a professor emeritus at uh, the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, where he taught comparative literature, literary studies and translation for several decades. 1970 to 2006. He also works at Poet, which is at Fort Lesnar. He was the European Secretary of ICLA and Film, and he was also the founding Vice President of the Society of General Compare, and also the European Society for Translation Studies. As most of you know, he was the key person you know, and one of the pioneers of translation studies when it started as a new discipline. With uh, people like uh, Gideon Chori, Lambert founded a 
one of the leading journals which is titled Target. He has published extensively. He has created a special research program in U1 right from 1989, which was the, I think that was, that laid the foundation for the Center for Translation Studies, which is called as CETRA. It was uh, a research summer school where Lambert is honorary president. They have, he has been associated with several other programs in Europe and other universities across the world in both cognitive literature and translation studies. He also has been a visiting professor in, um, in, in the University of Santa Catarina, Brazil, since 2011, Florianopolis uh, in Brazil. He has also been a guest professor at Penn State University, New York, University, University of Alberta, University of Amsterdam and Sorbonne. He was the European Secretary of the International Comparative Literature Association from 1985 to 1991. He has several publications to his credit. The list is very long. Nevertheless, I would like to point out some of his important works for the benefit of the younger uh, generation because the goal of CIL's uh, Foundation Day lecture series is not just to listen to the uh, great scholars, but also to know about the scholar. So that is why we keep at least five to seven minutes to introduce uh, the speakers. Professor Lambert's works uh, include uh, traduction, literature, comparing translated literature within European literatures, and of course, goals in translation studies towards the genealogy of concepts, translation and globalization, the institutionalization of the discipline that was in 2013. I think he's going to uh, provide us some insights from all these works. Also interdisciplinarity in translation studies and translation today and translation research. There are many more publications and he has got several prizes and awards. It's very interesting and he has a very impressive career. But since all of us are waiting to hear from him, I would like to stop here and welcome Professor Jose Lambert once again on behalf of the Central Institute of Indian Languages to deliver his talk. Yeah. So. Thank you so much, Professor Uma, if I may say this in the Brazilian style. Uh, thank you also, dear colleague, uh, who have introduced me at the beginning. Uh, I would say to everyone, very welcome, as if I were at home among you. But you have just noticed, together with me, how many technical difficulties we have to overcome for sharing our everyday life. And this is a pity. I apologize. I must have to repair some of the stuff here in my uh, in my computer equipment. And uh, I'm grateful to my colleague from the technical service on the at the faculty who finally uh, succeeded in putting us in a real life situation. Now. Uh, Dear Professor Uma, you may, in case there is any technical problem or a more uh, fundamental problem, you may interrupt me uh, and questions. Well, uh, I'm happy to be able to offer questions. I just hope that our time schedule is not in disaster due to the delay that we had so far. So. I try to stick to one hour. I have to stick to one hour. And then I would be very happy to listen to you and to discuss with you. Now, there we go at this moment. But I'll uh, shorten, first of all, uh, the goal of my talk. I want to insist mainly on the very important signification of the fact that universities worldwide, but still in a selective or eclectic way, 
I'm very happy that universities worldwide have finally recognized the relevance and the importance of translation, interpretation, media tran translation phenomena as part of the key tasks of universities. I want, that's what I want to show because I would like to help inviting you into joining the academic teams that do research. I hope to show in my explanation how much this is needed. Indeed, in my title you read translation is old, but translation studies is young. Uh, translation studies is young. I would say we are happy that it is that young, but we know that we need so much more and so much energy and resources in order to fil fulfill our task. Now, I, uh, well, I try to convince you for in entering into the research game by indicating what kind of responsibilities we have. And I would even say that I try at the end to extend our responsibility to the level of universities as management. Because so far, universities leave the question of translation to a specialized department. And departments very often can get into struggle with each other. So who is responsible for research and for intelligence about translation? Who is responsible for that? Uh, I would say that our rectors and our managers leave this to the various departments that may be fair play. But for entering into international communication, universities so far, they work on their own. Yeah. Well, I hope so far you hear me well. Do you understand me well? Yes, Jose. Can you also share your slides? Can you show your text? And now comes my text. Now, yes. Uh, yeah, there is, there is not much text here, but the reason why translation is so important, that's the entrance. Translation is everywhere. But how comes we are so so unaware of this. So how comes we, as universities, did not insist on that? Now I still see that I have a technical problem with my screen. Uh, or do you want us to share the slides? We have your slides. Yeah, well, if it is better that you show the slides, the slide, that's okay, but I guess that this is better now, is it? Oh, we can't see your text. You can't see it? Not yet. Oh, well, then it may be better for you to show your slides, if, if you can, if this is yes. not, because you have the text in hand and I can refer to it systematically. All right, uh, we will do it from our side. Okay, just yeah. can you handle it? Se ela pode vir um momento. Não sou seguro que pode, mas isso é eles não vem e foi. Sim, mas não, but I also need to see the professor, so it may be better. Uh, Ora, eh, quero ver a senhora, a professora, aí, eh, como, como... Aí, como a Valesca falou, não tem como lamper eles com a tela cheia assim. Sim, eles vão mostrar meio yes. texto. Uh, your slides are on. 
now you can see you can also see and you can continue yeah well there i go and continue again an excuse is because i am between two centers that organize my my session uh, the faculty and here at home well it's a well-known sentence among translation scholars that translation is everywhere the ubiquity of translation now if translation is ubiquitous how can we explain that scholars and uh, intellectuals are so much unaware of it now we can explain it first of all by what is called the translator's invisibility you probably know the work and certainly the title of a book by lawrence venuti uh, but i disagree a little bit it's not the translator who is invisible only it's the full phenomenon of translation that is invisible and this explains to a large extent why universities intellectuals are so unaware of it yes when i was a student i was told by uh, my professors and by linguists that translation was a question of techniques a technical issue and when we were wondering about more uh, say the more cultural components of it I, uh, my colleagues from india have already insisted on that this morning when we insisted on culture we were uh, i would say kicked off by our colleagues because they were convinced that translation is a matter of languages and linguistics and they uh, after all they stopped the dialogue so there was no dialogue between various kinds of people who were interested in translation they were working one by one or groups by groups now this is what is changing at this moment since a few decades i would say fortunately i would even try to show that research on translation can only function well if there is a better integration between the categories that i'm going to use categories such as language linguistics even politics and so on and so many other areas now i try to show you uh, something that you will understand immediately that this how translation in our contemporary world is omnipresent or ubiquitous and how it plays even an important role but very often people are not accepting that this is a matter of research on translation i give you some examples so one can understand that people from machine translation in the 1950s or the 1960s ignored culture but the real uh, experts that were that were responsible for i would say a, a too exclusively technical view on translation well they represented mainly translation theory and when myself with uh, more important colleagues when we started doing research and publishing about i would say a larger and more integrated view of translation integrated into culture and uh, research about culture when we did so uh, machine translation of course was not supposed to solve that problem and uh, more disappointing was that for instance translation training did not really take that into well it depends but sometimes they uh, reduced research on translation to say to literature and the rest was a technical matter 
Well, I try to show you by a few cases, and I'll uh, come back to some other cases later. I try to show you by a few cases how translation is an important issue in our contemporary world. The first example I'm going to give you is an example that I borrow from uh, publications in the Baltic states. The Baltic states, I guess you know where that is. The Baltic states, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, and so on. Uh, three smaller countries between uh, the north of Poland and Russia. Now, the Baltic states are members of the European Union. They take part in the European Union, and as you know, the European Union has a high opinion of translation, and they provide translation and interpreting all the time. And when uh, Estonia or Lithuania take the floor in the European Union. They also make use of Russian. Russian is one of the languages of the European Union. But there's a very particular culture problem linked with the translations produced for or by the Baltic states as soon as Russian enters into the picture. Now, I know this example since a few years, so I'm not inspired at all by the news about Russia nowadays, but it has something to do with it. When Russian is used in the European Union by uh, translators who represent the Baltic states, the translators or the interpreters, mainly interpreters, they have to be very much aware of the fact that in the Baltic states, there are at least three different generations of Russians who have immigrated. There are the Russian immigrants, say, from before the Second World War. Then there are the Russian uh, immigrants from just after the Second World War and during a few years. But there are also the people from the generation of, say, Gorbachev. You probably know Gorbachev, you know names. So besides the Russian of the Stalin culture, there, were, there are the Russians of the Gorbachev culture and a few cultures in between. Now, when the translator makes use of one or two wrong words for one of these generations, the translator is immediately colored as someone who represents a given political party. This is exactly what they want to avoid. That this speaking not on behalf of uh, citizens who make use of Russian, but rather on behalf of citizens that happen to represent a given political situation. You understand that this may be delicate, it may be inefficient in political matters, and even differently. So this is a matter for translation training, but not only for translation training, because the consequences can be enormous. I give you another example, and I borrow it from my own country, Belgium. Now, you may happen to know that Belgium makes use of, uh, officially, of three different languages. Uh, in the north, we call that language Dutch. We used to call it Flemish. But the cooperation with Holland has uh, influenced the terminology. But OK, we have Dutch. In the south of Belgium, we make use of French. And in a few eastern uh, little cities and in uh, a rural part of Belgium, there is also a German-speaking minority. Now. 
what has happened with these languages in my country? Apparently, at first sight, this is a matter of languages and not a matter of translation. Well, you may understand that from the moment there are more than uh, one or two languages, that translation is involved. Now, our Belgian bank system has, of course, been influenced and heavily influenced by internationalization. Our Belgian banks used to make use of the three official languages in the country, Dutch, French, German. Now, little by little, due to internationalization, English has penetrated also into the Belgian banks, and these, Be these Belgian banks, of course, do not worry too much about the country Belgium, they worry about other matters. And little by little, the very small language in our country, German, has been sacrificed, it has been given up, and little by little, English has uh, taking the place of German. One might say that the consequence has not been striking so far. So our politicians never talk about this. Our banks never talk about this. But in fact, they cooperate in the, in the changes of the Belgian society, the Belgian community by replacing one of the official Belgian languages by another important language, English. This changes the relationships between the Belgian community and between Belgian communities and visiting people. This means that society is modified by the system of languages and, has been, and uh, as has been demonstrated very recently by an important colleague of mine, this influences also via translation, because translation depends on so many aspects of the, organi of the organization of society that you can't change languages in a community without changing the community. And an important component of uh, such a situation is that these communities, in order to communicate with each other, need translation. They need translation, and at this moment in Brussels, instead of making use of three languages, at least 60 languages are used. In, uh, well, in European countries like uh, the United Kingdom, some 60, some uh, 70 or 80 languages are used all the time. Our Belgian, uh, our Belgian criminology and our Belgian police system in the city of Antwerp, which is an important uh, port in the international world, in that city, more than 120 or more than 130 languages are used in order to make communication possible between the various nationalities that have a role in, universe, in uh, the court system. Well, the fact that translation is more and more visible. Sometimes it's even used in a remarkable way by business companies and even by politicians. I show you at the end how politicians make a systematically use of translation, but in a hidden way. So Translation is not visible and it has not been made visible by all people who translate and distribute texts. It may be the opposite. So it can be either one or, or the other. A new concept in translation studies has been uh, developed. You will all understand this. as a concept of directionality. 
from the moment you have communities with more languages, the dynamics of communication depend more on certain groups than on other groups. And the translation is produced by some of these uh, pioneers of communication. And this influences communication in society. Well, now I, I'm going to read a little bit more uh, strictly my text at this moment. And uh, for a few minutes, I'll do so. Uh, I'll show you how translation studies has developed and how it has developed. I would even say how I was part of the game. It has developed mainly in Western countries. Now, I'm sure that it is developing fast now on the other continents, and I'm sure that this will increase all the time. Now, when we organized, we organized an, an important symposium, well prepared, and especially the big name of James Holmes was the pioneer of this conference. James Holmes uh, wanted to establish a discipline within university. He did not uh, object against other kinds of work on translation. At that moment, translation was uh, produced by machine translation. It has changed a lot later. Uh, it was produced by translation trainers. And these trainers, or a few philosophers, or translators themselves, produced prestigious books and successful books, and books that are still important. The problem is that all these publications were, uh, say, were dealing with fragments or with particular areas of translated communication and not with translation in general. Now, Holmes's intention was to establish communication between especially translation theories. And, and I was so surprised that my discipline at that moment, comparative literature, hardly never focused on translation uh, phenomena. I, that's why I started dealing with translation and since then little by little translation has been developing within comparative literature but I was very disappointed by it because it was not very not very scholarly uh, well scholarly based but I studied so many German translations uh, uh, published in France and in French, translations of various kinds, poetry, novels, and so on, travel stories. Now, my surprise was, I started reading these translation theories, my surprise was that in every translation that uh, I opened, it was full of phenomena that the translation theories did not even mention. Now I give you a few examples and that's my challenge for you. Try it out with translations. I did not blame translators nor translations. I simply wanted to know how this worked. Now, uh, one of the important writers in that period, and he was supposed to be a revolutionary writer, was the German writer Ernst Theodor Amadeus Hoffmann. Hoffmann, Hoffmann is famous, I hope you uh, know at least the name. He got famous for his fantastic stories or his tales, fantastic tales. One of the remarkable confirmations of uh, Hoffman's role in, 
I would say in world literature is that his concept fantastic or fantastic literature or phenomena that are fantastic this became a new word in many languages and this new word has been created not by Hoffmann but by the translation of that German word fantastisch. I don't explain anything more but within the text so not only the key concept fantastisch has been adapted I would say recreated by translators but his main text, I have ed edited uh, these texts. I have published three volumes of the French translations of the fantastic tales. Now, I'll indicate how the translators adapted systematically their translated text to the French text model and to the model of narration, novels, and so on, in French. But not only the novel framework changed, but also words, things that have nothing to do with literature, but that happen to be part of these literary texts. I give a few examples. The distribution of these uh, tales in paragraphs was adapted. Sometimes a paragraph was dropping fully. Sometimes one paragraph was combined with another. The chapters very often were changed. Sometimes the order changed. But also sometimes the, I would say, the beginning of a chapter now, I could give you a very short example, and I'll stop that illustration now. Uh, I'll give you a very short example. In, uh, at the beginning of one of these tales, there is something like a historical identification of the story. And in German, uh, Hoffmann wrote, Im Jahre 1800, und so viel, 1800, 1800. But the writer dropped the last two digits and wrote only one eight. So it was in the 19th century. The French translator added one figure, one eight two. What was happening? The translator put his story within the tradition of the romantic historical novel that was very successful at that moment because Walter Scott was one of the great novelists at that moment. It was linked with the story of uh, nationalities and so on. Well, I, I uh, stop that kind of examples, but this was inspiring, not, not my analysis, Turi has made much more in that area. And in fact, what has happened little by little, so this descriptive translation study, that's how Turi gave a name to his own, uh, to his own developments, descriptive translation studies established the necessity to describe and describe and to observe and to try to analyze and to explain translation phenomena. Now, how, I don't see what kind of translations would escape this, would escape this necessity. But at the beginning, descriptive translation studies uh, uh, concentrated much more on the literary areas. But nowadays, it is very clear, as I'm going to show you at the end, it is very cl clear that not any kind of communication seems to be excluded from such processes. Okay, now 
in my introduction, to it, I move to screen four now, and then we accelerate it quite considerably. Uh, Professor Uma, if there is any problem, and maybe you warn me when we run almost out of time. Uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but I respect my full uh, planning. I'm accelerating a little bit now. I have sent to you or to Professor Uma, and you may receive the document, uh, the item translation as distributed by Wikipedia. Now, people within the academic world know well that Wikipedia and this kind of encyclopedia, of course, is very useful, but also very often quite misleading. Misleading, and you will see why. Well, Wikipedia is devoting quite some time to the development of translation studies. But I would say it, it turns out to be very disappointing. Very disappointing because uh, Wikipedia puts side by side many kinds of research and theories on translation. You will see that so many experts nowadays still use translation theory. And even some among uh, my friends from the 1970s uh, move again into translation theory. This means that some among the insights provided by descriptive translation studies have been forgotten. This has a lot to do, of course, with the distribution channels. Now, Wikipedia belongs to such distribution channels. And I would say that the items discussed in the Wikipedia notice are disappointing. Why? Because several so-called schools are put side by side. These schools are supposed to be, I guess, based on particular theories, and you can apply that to this. But there are obvious mistakes. Among the mistakes for it is, is that sometimes uh, certain names are mentioned and they are put in the wrong into the, into the wrong school. So this is generally speaking not the goal of schools. But okay, the the idea of any discipline introduced by James Holmes is almost fully lacking, notwithstanding one particular phenomenon, very important, very important, Wikipedia makes use of translation studies. So the concept developed by Holmes with a very explicit consideration, the concept has been forgotten and certainly its intentions its intention was to support a discipline and specialization areas. There are lots of other, uh, say, real mistakes in these notices. Uh, there is a lot of interesting, uh, interesting uh, information also, by the way. Now, in my approach, to translation studies. My goal is to show the necessity indeed or the relevance of translation studies. And it is clear that I have no time for dealing with all various approaches and I do not know them all uh, that well. But it's clear <coughs> that there has been heavy interaction between these so-called schools the first group to refuse the word school was the, uh, the descriptive translation studies. But it is clear that other areas are lacking. Translation training, machine translation, that have been uh, submitted to very interesting developments. 
and quite a few among them confirm the necessity to take into consideration the culture phenomenon. Now, two among our colleagues have even made use of culture and translation, and I would say without still referring to Holmes. Now, this is, I would say, this is a pity. I have called it at a given moment, the Brexit movement in translation studies. You all know what Brexit means in politics. And indeed, it was mainly the Anglo-Saxon world that tried to continue with translation theory as if nothing else had happened. But quite a few fundamental areas uh, in the discipline are heavily indebted to descriptive translation studies. Now, Turi himself used this concept descriptive because the lack, the lack of empirical consideration was so heavy, but he used it as a channel into the new discipline. Now, it's only around 1990 that this discipline has been institutionalized. I may have some time for uh, saying a few words about these things. Now, I move to screen five. I have told that uh, in that Wikipedia notice, there's a lack of uh, considerations, I would say, on the historical development, say, on the dynamics. So, how did research on translation develop? It is clear that several among these so-called schools have been uh, influential on each other. I also remember very well how, for instance, uh, Turi himself, he did so at Leuven, Turi himself discussed with Hans Vermeer. Hans Vermeer was a leading personality in the German so-called Scopus theory. And Scopus was, uh, I would say, a movement that was uh, mainly concentrating on translation training. Now, translation training has uh, a well-identified place but it's not often discussed in the Holmes article and in Turi's, in Turi's contributions. But uh, Hans Vermeer did not accept the distinction between translation training and the other areas of research. Okay, that I, one can understand. And uh, I would say uh, we were full of respect for Vermeer and for other people. Well, one of the key people in uh, these years, and I move into, uh, into that screen, I guess it's screen six. Uh, moment. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting examples of people who have influenced the dynamics of translation studies, say in the 1980s mainly, and also in the 1990s, was, we called her a linguist, but her uh, training was more complex than that, Mary Snell Hornby. Mary Snell Hornby had I guess Austrian origin anyway, she has been, anyway, she was German speaking. She has been professor in, uh, in Geneva, at Geneva. Then she went to Vienna and she was the great personality in uh, the areas of translation training and translation linguistics or the linguistics of translation. In 1987, 87, 88, she published a book entitled, now listen well, it's interesting. The book was entitled Translation Studies, the Integrated Approach. It was for the first time that an expert from another 
group or school, whatever you call it, uh, that a so-called outsider for us published, no, made use of the title of Holmes' title, Translation Studies. So translation studies is a very young concept. And she used that concept very explicitly because she supported the ideas of Holmes in terms of necessity of establishing an academic discipline. But she was absolutely critical with, say, with our ideas. I remember discussions, with historical discussions between Theo Hermans who at the beginning was a young member of our group. Afterwards, he left us, but okay. Uh, in his 1985 book, uh, uh, one of the first public manifestations of our, say, development, he noticed that the, the common basis for all members of our group around Holmes was that we assumed or accepted all that real research on translation could not be finalized, could not be exhausted by linguistics. This was a heavy revolution in the landscape of translation studies. It was heavily criticized. There were other positions like that in Tudi's text, like the, the importance of the receiving culture, say the reception or the target culture, and so on. But anyway, Mary Snell Hornby, uh, every five or six or uh, at least ten years, published the state of the art of research on translation and in translation studies. Uh, without her and without her book, I guess that the institutionalizing of translation could never have take, been taking place. This indicates again that little by little, the institutionalization of translation studies has been successful. It has been successful, yeah, I move to screen seven, it has been successful to the extent that many universities started offering programs and even PhD programs on translation. So the goal of translation studies was not anymore just to train translators. Now, since the institutionalization, uh, one can say that many universities combine the training of translators with the training of translation scholars. Translation scholars, I'll come back to that, to the training of translation scholars. But uh, the institutionalization within universities had a strong influence on the new landscape of research areas in translation. Whatever the goals were of, and may have been of this development. Now, I still move on. I'm not going to insist much, but what I wanted to develop in screen eight is that the institutionalization, it was rather timid at the beginning, and it's only in uh, 1985 that a really official uh, programmatic publication has been uh, written for the larger audience, and it was still in a, in a small publishing house. But <coughs> uh, Holmes's texts, there were not many, have been published in 1988, by Van den Broek, who was a member of the Holmes group, an important member. Now, Holmes died in 86, and so on. So you can see that there was kind of a survival. But something very important happened for our contemporary 
situation, we started organizing not only, I say we, but there were many other people, but we developed a research project on literature and translation in France in the first half of the 19th century. If you want, you can read the very important reviews by Anthony Pym. Anthony Pym was probably nowadays one of the real guides in research on translation. Now he made clear that real research on translation phenomena needs to be heavily supported by sociology. Well, what happened is that in fact descriptive translation studies, which uh, was uh, had literary origins and moved more into sociology already in Turi's work, well, uh, little by little, the institutionalization was linked, first of all, with the journal Target in 89. And the same year at my university, I created an institute that was called at the beginning CERA. CERA was the name of a bank because the bank supported us during six years. Without them, I would say that we would never have existed. But our research training institute, it was an institute that wanted to train young researchers. Now we have trained a little bit less than 1,000 alumni from five continents since 1989. And among them, you may uh, check in the big uh, trans, uh, bibliographies the number of people who have a big name in translation studies now and who was a member of uh, CETRA, this number is very high. But okay, I uh, could mention also that there are colleagues who are fundamentally critical, if not more, with the idea of institutions. This has probably to do with, I would say, with the cultural split between, say, the more continental uh, Western group and, say, the Anglo-Saxon group which uh, developed cultural studies, but culture studies and translation theory, these are the names that they use for their identification. Now, I would say that they are uh, rather far away of support given to translation studies as a discipline. And even uh, one can say that Hermans, who is, uh, as, uh, I would say, as one of the pioneer students, is very critical with uh, descriptive translation studies, but he is mixing it up with uh, the discipline as such. Descriptive translation studies is part of it. Edwin Gensler, another uh, Citra alumni, uh, is even speaking about the end of a discipline and so on. But this looks very American, uh, I would say. There are many Americans who like to write about the death of disciplines. Now, I would suggest at this moment that I simply finish by giving a few illustrations. That's my screen 15. Uh, I show you what kind of responsibilities have not yet been covered not even by, say, descriptive research and hardly by the discipline. And this shows that something is still very weakly developed. Uh, I, give, I give you one simple example. Back into literature, I would say, world literature. World literature is a very, near, it's not a new concept. You may know the free history of the concept. It has become, uh, say, even popular in comparative literature worldwide. And it's especially popular in the Eastern, in the really Eastern world, not what we called Eastern in the 1960s. That was European. But Chinese culture, 
is really fascinated by world culture. But a uh, uh, very important book uh, by uh, Casanova, Pascal Casanova, a disciple of Pierre Bourdieu, one of the most important sociologists. That book is a very interesting contribution. I would say, unfortunately, that the experts in comparative literature did not explore this. I have just published uh, a long article, really long, uh, entitled World Literature, Comparative Literature and Translation Studies. Now, uh, Comparative literature has been involved. In fact, they have never really given real support to translation studies. Now, my thesis is, how can you talk about world literature from the moment you don't give a central place to translation? So, lots of genres on the world level are indebted to translation, they would never have been uh, developed without translations. And I'm sure that some among you are uh, well enough aware of, say, various kinds of literature and literary translations in Asia. I'm not an expert myself, but I know people who have uh, worked on uh, internationalization of literature, say kind of uh, world literature. Now, how could you deal with world literature and with the canonization of international literature if you don't take into consideration translation phenomena? And so on. But that's an argument, world literature, it has an influence on many world phenomena. But I rather finished by giving a few examples of very different areas of culture and communication, like, say, legislation. Uh, I don't believe that this has been developed in the various excellent uh, publications on law translation or legal translation. But I give you a key example. At a given moment, I have been supervising a PhD on Burundi legislation. Burundi, you all know where Burundi is, east of Congo, in the middle of Africa. Now, uh, you may know that Congo was a Belgian colony uh, until a given moment, and Burundi was linked with that situation. Now, the history and the history of the translation of the Burundi constitution, first of all, demonstrates that the Burundi constitution is, a, I would say, a mixture of Belgian constitution, the French constitution, because the French had their own Congo, a little bit north of the Belgian Congo. All these constitutions were the result of systematic translations from European languages. And when the European models did not satisfy or give satisfaction, the translators were looking for the other African constitutions, or they were producing their own version. Now, you may happen to know a little bit about what we call, and what is called since many years, many decades, indirect translation. One of the important phenomena of the dynamics of translation and culture uh, one of the important components is the use of indirect translation. Indirect translation uh, in literature, but not only. Business companies nowadays make systematic use of indirect translation. The interpreters in the European Union make systematically use of what they call relay 
translation or relay interpreting. They interpret, uh, give meetings, not by listening to the speaker, but by listening to one of his translators in the language that they know better than the speaker's one. Media studies. How would media function without translation? Now it's very clear that media phenomena are systematically translated and distributed in translation interpreted and so on. So the oral written phenomena is fascinating here. And these are all questions that very often are not called translation. The same in uh, communication departments. They uh, sometimes they happen to deal with translation, but this is exactly as in comparative literature. The comparatives or the communication experts are not familiar with the whole question of translation, translation studies. And this means that they very often improvise. So universities deserve a better approach to the translation phenomena than what actual, what contemporary translation studies is offering them. And I would include them there, I'm going to stop, I would include the role of universities. Uh, I start by an example. The well-known COVID, the tragical COVID story worldwide, will change the relationships between universities. Not because uh, contemporary communication will be less international. No, because the technology is well advanced. Whatever has been demonstrated at the beginning of my speech this morning. But it's clear that communication and electronic communication will function. But business companies, universities uh, were in charge of exchange programs. It's very clear that these exchange programs will be more and more occupied by machines and electronics and will imply lots and lots uh, less, much less people than before. So the mobility of people will uh, decrease in these areas because it takes money and the electronic communication will take the place. Now, this will change the relationships between culture. And that's one of the confirmations. You may happen to know that wonderful book by Walter Ong. It's entitled Orality and Literacy, the technologizing of the world. He could have written the technologizing of the world because that's what is actually going on nowadays. And technologizing means that there is a distribution not only of uh, communication and translation, but a distribution of money, power. This shows that communities worldwide will change again. They have changed so often. They will change again due to translation phenomena. How? That's another story. That's what needs to be studied. And this shows again that almost all disciplines at universities deserve to devote more time to translation within their books. For instance, how many professors have a bibliography at the end of their best classes, their most important classes? Now, how many among their key books have not been translated? From what kind of channels do they come? I would say that it's clear here that universities still have to discover international communication, or at least part of it, that part that is supported by translation. I thank you for being so patient. I hope you did not suffer too much because it was more a dialogue than it would have been if we would have had our image.
Dear Professor Uma, uh, you have the floor and you know how to organize a discussion session. I'll be happy to answer. If you see my face during this exercise, the better it is. Unfortunately, I can't see you. Hello. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Lambert. It was wonderful listening to you for the last one hour. You took us into a beautiful journey into the development of translation studies as a new discipline. Like it was fantastic walking through the different uh, time periods in history, starting from uh, Holmes, Jury, Hermans, and your own work, of course. You touched upon quite a bit with translation as a discipline and the, the evolution of translation studies as a new discipline and what, how it is being interpreted across five continents. The interesting uh, case studies of Belgium, Baltic studies and uh, Canada also do a lot of uh, interesting facts for us. You showed us how institutionalization of translation studies was successful and you emphasized and reiterated that the goal of translation studies is not just to train translators. This was a, one of the most important claims that I liked it. And also you touched upon several other issues like how we can talk about world literature without talking about translation given the fact that we live in the era of translation and communication technologies. What are the roles of universities in exchange programs and how technology will rule us in future and replace humans with different electronic uh, gadgets and electronic communication. Uh, it was uh, not very uh, easy to give such a wonderful talk in one hour. I really thank you for uh, making it possible. Now the floor is open for discussion. I request the audience to interact with Professor Lambert, questions, feedbacks, or any comments, suggestions. Just feel free to interact with him. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you also for your summary. I'm glad with your summary. I appreciate it. Thank you. I am listening. You're welcome. Yeah. Any questions? Or you can open any other dialogue. Yes, Sandhya? Uh, yes, Tuma. Um, Professor Lambert, merci beaucoup. Merci pour cet uh, exposé très brillant. Uh, thank you for the insightful lecture about translation. Station and as uh, uh, Professor Omar said, you really touch all the aspects of uh, uh, translation studies. You also talk about the importance of research for translation studies to have a continuity, which uh, uh, is, uh, I mean, these days, like in Mauritius, we can say that the, it's a country where we almost speak uh, five languages, like all the citizens, almost four to five languages, but still very uh, less work uh, concerning uh, translation itself. And uh, as far as research is concerned, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's very few, you can count on your fingers. Uh, but uh, I, I, I do believe that this is very important and uh, some, I don't know, maybe how, how we can evolve things out here. Like uh, uh, we, do, we do have uh, a good uh, literature. We do have people uh, uh, indulge in translation, but how, how can we uh, go further deep in this, in this field? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your commentary. And thank you for your final question. I like it very much because uh, I would say, after all, that's the heart of the matter. How can we get our own companions and partners 
in academia involved in research on translation phenomena and how can we demonstrate that translation is not only an interesting topic it is of course an interesting topic but it is so much more that's I, I didn't use that key concept, another key concept of Turi, uh, his concept of norms. Now, this idea of norms has been borrowed from sociology. I'm convinced that uh, the very influential position of Anthony Pimps is also heavily indebted to his, uh, I would say, his uh, starting point, because he started as a sociologist and he developed his activity so uh, Pim has probably the best documentation worldwide about the discipline and that was one of the dreams of Holmes but I did not answer your question so far but why is it so important well because uh, I could say that myself, I really discovered the problem of translation and translation research after our conference in Leuven. And the most influential and the most impressive contributions there were the contributions by Turi and by Ibrahim. Now, why were they so? influential. Uh, even Zohar puts his uh, article about the position of translated literature. In fact, he means the position of translation in the literary policy system. I could say rather in the world policy system. So you should read that article. But for me, these were the instruments that are used for the for starting up research projects. Now, starting up research projects, this has happened all over the world under the influence of descriptive translation studies. The starting point is wherever you uh, discover translation phenomena it may be interesting to scrutinize them it is not sure at all that you will find uh, say wonderful things or marvels but there is a good chance that you will discover uh, what i call the dynamics of culture with very new <laughs> Now, when we have started this up at my university and with uh, very limited instruments and resources, we have, we have received uh, decent budgets at the beginning, but I started in 1979 such uh, first project. And all the rest that we have developed our experience in the field goes back to that. But I have more, I have more to suggest about such research projects. And I would even be very glad if I could get involved in new research projects about cultures like yours. I'm involved in some projects in China. They, they are fascinating for me, not because I happen to know much about it, I do not happen to know much, exactly because I do not happen to know that much, and because we can cooperate. And outsiders see lots of things that the insiders don't see. So you need to have mixed teams, but you need to have a strong basis, and I mean strong young people. And as propaganda, I, I sometimes make some propaganda. Now I make a little bit of propaganda, if you forgive me. That research project about literature and translation in France, we started in 1979. At the beginning, 
so and we published a few things and i would say the most important result was this listen well at the beginning of the 1990s the young students who started working within the framework of such a project hello some 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 12 or 15 young scholars got their phd with me at that moment not only with me but okay and i would say i can mention you now at least six seven names among them of people who are known as international top scholars and what they have published is much more impressive than what i did so translation studies has been has been very instructive and very uh, wealthy say booming and one of the things that they have just done now i would say it's it's symbolic one of the things that they have just done now in my own country uh, I'm sure that Professor Uma knows a little bit about the history of that culture and about the things that I'm going to say now. The three communities, no, the first two communities in Belgium, the Dutch-speaking one and the French-speaking one, were in a very different relationship in the 19th century than now. And the first illustration of this was the Belgian uh, Constitution. Now, research about the history of the Belgian constitution and the progressive recognition of uh, the Dutch language in official texts illustrates the shift of power in our country, say, from 1800 to the year 2000. And this is something that even uh, the experts in law studies have never been able to catch. So the renewal of, of the history of legislation and the history of Belgian communities is heavily indebted to the things we started up in the 1980s. And there are at least three or four new PhDs on that kind of matters and so on. And there was a conference on legislation and translation at Leuven uh, with very international uh, participation. Now, uh, sorry for being long again, but that's my answer to your interesting question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, any other questions? Or comments? Yeah, uh, till someone else asks, I would like to continue this thread, what you are uh, just uh, have been discussing. Uh, I was very curious, like, see, right now, like, you rightly pointed out, he did, what is the future of translation studies, what we need to do further. So we have been discussing a lot about uh, the different developments over the last few decades. Uh, for lack of time, I believe you did not touch upon the translation policies across the different countries and just what Sandhya and you were discussing just now about uh, the diaspora. Since she comes from a place where you have French Creoles and you are also speaking French in the Belgian uh, part, especially in Brussels. I was just curious when world literature or any literature or any other text for that matter gets translated into French, how does it reach the diaspora? And how much meaning is distorted? Or do you have any ideas? What are their policies in using different standards for translation? Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's also a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, I first say I'm not really an expert, but I know I'm a witness of what's going on in that area. Now, diaspora, of course, is a very sensitive issue in our contemporary society. 
uh, one of the things I have learned in this kind of translation studies is, say, to avoid being, say, normative. Avoiding being normative is not compatible with real research. If you try to support a given position, you will uh, start by supporting that position and not by supporting your own research. But back to diaspora. Uh, I'll give you one example of a publication around that. And I think it is symbolic. And uh, again, sorry, I have to borrow a little bit from around my own university. Uh, in 2019, I have uh, made a trip in uh, China. One, some, well, one month ago. And our last, my last intervention there was at Beijing at uh, um, probably the top university in the area of language and translation uh, studies. And there was a conference and we were invited, you will see who is we, we were invited as the first speakers in the conference on the tradition of translation in Chinese national literature. Maybe the word national was not used. Okay. And I felt honored for being invited to open the session, but that's not what I'm going to mention now. What I'm going to mention now is that a second paper was given by my disciple. Her name is Rene Maylard. Rene Maylard. She's on the board of, uh, tar of Target still and so on. You can easily find her name. She has uh, produced a lot in terms of publication. She happens to be, but that's between brackets. She has been the vice rector of research in my university for four years. And now she has a second term as vice rector, as the vice rector for the humanities. I'm proud about this. But I'm even more proud about the fact that as a student in translation studies, she was selected as a vice rector in research at my university, which means that translation studies is really recognized in my university. Well, it's still uh, also controversial, but uh, so research on translation can lead into the highest areas of research. But now to her paper, now to her paper and to the fact that her paper was, uh, I would say, accepted as a key paper in such a meeting in the middle of China. She devoted her paper to the city of, listen well, Brussels. So you probably all know well that Brussels is not only the capital of Belgium, but you probably also know that uh, Brussels is, I would say, uh, rather important European, maybe more than European, uh, meeting place meeting place and uh, place with political and other responsibility. Now, what happened in Brussels in history, that's well known, what she has added uh, was not well known, not even by me. Brussels uh, is, sent, is situated in the middle of Belgium and on the heart of Belgium, I would say, because the, ling the linguistic border that divides the country between the Dutch-speaking and the French-speaking part is running through Brussels. In the history of Belgium, hardly any cities have moved from the Dutch community into the French one or vice versa. So this linguistic border is very static. 
except except in the case of Brussels. In the case of Brussels, it's very spectacular. In the middle of 1830, 35, say, some 35% of the people were speaking French at Brussels. So the others were speaking mainly Dutch. There were a few other languages, but okay. In 1985, statistics demonstrate that around 86 percentage of the Brussels city are French speaking, and the other ones are Dutch speaking. Uh, yeah, they were mainly Dutch speaking. Now, at this moment, so say Brussels, maybe there were four or 10 or maybe a bit more languages in 1985. At this moment, according to the statistics that Rena Maillard uh, made use of, there are at least more than 80 languages, which means that it's kind of a microcosm. And uh, as a young man and as a young intellectual, I was involved in cultural uh, organizations and so on. And uh, I would say, I may confess, a little bit nationalistic and also, so it's not about being, uh, about feeling like this or like that. The question is the problem of this diaspora and the mobility of people, and especially uh, mobility of people coming from new societies. Uh, by the way, the best, Multilingual speakers in Belgium are immigrants from North African origin who are living in Antwerp, not in Brussels. But uh, the situation in Brussels is so complicated and the Belgians with their uh, very political organization of languages have of course tried to refine their approach to the population. Of course, in the political life, it's full of, well, sorry for saying so, but it's, it's full of probably intelligent options, but also very stupid options. Now, the question of this the diaspora shows that our politicians speak only about languages, many languages and so on. Reina Melatz has demonstrated in her paper, that's the main thing that I remember, she has demonstrated that as long as translation and translated discourse is not involved <coughs> in this language policy, that they will simply increase the conflictual situation instead of, uh, of solving it. Well, so remember that the article has not yet been published. It will certainly be, uh, be published uh, very soon. But you may look for the other publications. There, uh, there are at least two other publications that I want to mention, but I'll be short. Uh, one, is, uh, one is coming out now. It will be uh, due to Peter Flynn. Peter Flynn is a colleague of ours, member of the CETRA staff, just like Rene Meilatz, of course. Uh, Peter Flynn, he is of Irish origin, Flynn, F-L-Y-N-N. -N. He lives at Ghent and he's, he has just finalized a book where he, uh, a book devoted to the question of multilingualism and translation within the many big buildings in the Flemish suburbs. So diaspora, but diaspora small scale. Small scale and from real life how these people in their community, how they live together and how they make use of languages and combinations of languages. I would say uh, these are things that uh, are very 
relevant. And of course, you see the link not only with uh, multilingualism, but with sociology and so on. One of the reasons why uh, Yves Gambier, uh, our French uh, member of the CETRA staff, is so active in media translation and so on, it's exactly that. So sociologists and sociolinguists have a lot more to do than what they have done already now, but a few people like Gambi and so on are very important. Now, uh, I know there are publications coming uh, up or out. Uh, by the way, I forgot to tell you and uh, to tell Professor Uma this. If you have specific questions, you may write to me, you may you may make use of my email. One of the things that was in trouble this morning was my email. And this explains a lot about the confusion at the beginning. I apologize again, I'm ashamed. But uh, you can write to me. My email address uh, can be used by the people who, well, please send, uh, give it only to the people who have attended our, our uh, aula, our uh, lesson. But I'll be glad to, to help you, and I, I would be glad to help starting up research, organized research, not the opposite, unorganized research. I like this or that translation, I want to study it. It's good to love your object of study, but it's delicate. And I would say it should be collective research. But uh, sorry for being long again. So diaspora, it's a hot topic. Uh, I'll, I'll look for it where I notice. I hope you all know the bibliographies in translation studies. One of the results of the institutionalization is there. So bibliographies, PhDs, journals, you also need, I would say, I know that China is seduced by the idea of starting up an organization of translation studies for China. The country is big enough for deserving such uh, an organization, but I do not see why your country would not be as, as full of demands, questions, and tasks from that perspective. Yeah, so, thank, thank you. So uh, I see uh, we have with us Jilwan. Do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, this is a question to one of the members of your audience, I guess, not to me. Sorry? Sorry, uh, I did not understand well. Did you ask a question for Lambert, or is it a question that comes from your audience to Lambert? Uh, I am just, uh, I just noticed that Professor Jelvan Mueller de Oliveira is with us. So I just wanted to know if he wants to say something. Oh, oh yeah. I just, uh, thank Very you. Well. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm listening. Just my greetings on behalf of the UNESCO Chair on Language Policies for Multilingualism. Thank you for the invitation. Well, thank you for your uh, congratulations. I'll, I'll tell one thing, and very openly, I uh, insisted within my center, so I'm just a honorary president now, so I'm not someone who decides. I recommend it heavily to them to become part of your organization at UNESCO. I'm full of respect for UNESCO. Uh, for instance, uh, everything they have done in the distribution of culture uh, through five continents and so on. But I, I would say, as I have tried to show, from, even from your Indian perspective, but from the world perspective, uh, people and governments and so on, they like to talk about languages and so on, and with good intentions. But the problem is that languages on the world level, the more or less 7,000 languages, 
the problem is not the languages separated. I'm against separation in the research. Now, how can we deal with interaction between cultures as long as the question of translation is not a key item? So I would recommend, and that's one of the reasons why I was uh, very sad, because uh, my, my center is too small for uh, integrating such a task just simply into uh, your organization. But I would say this is very much needed. And if, if I could help there, I would, I would be glad. But of course, uh, I do not know your organization from inside. I know a little bit UNESCO activities uh, from the center of Paris and so on. But what is needed is really something more. And again, I stress that it is not enough to promote translation. The promotion of translation is necessary and is a positive input into what I would call the communication between people. But uh, what, what is needed is uh, uh, a really research on translation linked with translation training. And one of the new tendencies in that area is to envisage the job of translation, translation trainers as part of a marketing analysis. Well, I would not see why this would not be part of your, your uh, heavy programs. But thank you so much and thank you for taking part in the lecture. And I wish full success to all of you and I hope some of, of your successes are successes in research. Yeah, thank you. So any uh, response from Jilwan? Uh, I just want to thank uh, Professor Lambert. He was a very important person in the beginning, in the establishment of our UNESCO chair, dialoguing with Andrea Guerini in the program for translation studies at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. In and help the uh, inclusion of other universities. Uh, for example, University of Tartu, Stellenbosch in South Africa came to our chair because of uh, this Belgium uh, connection that Professor Lambert established. So I thank you very much, and I hope to have you in other opportunities in our activities uh, too. Thank you, thank you, Maren. Thank you, Jelan. So uh, it's uh, interesting to see like now translation studies is uh, gaining more and more uh, importance and relevance in interdisciplinary work. Any other questions or comments from others before I invite uh, my director Shalendra Mohan to say a few words again? Any other comments? Okay, so since we are running out of time, one last question from my side, because I do have a lot of things to talk with uh, Professor Lambert, but I am going to reserve those things for a private uh, talk. Nevertheless, I was curious, see now you talked and you touched about a topic called relay interpretation. So now, how would you relate it? So do you think translation studies should be independent from interpretation studies or do you want to see your or do you see a future in having a combined uh, uh, discipline called translation and interpretation studies if i yeah if uh, i i reformulate your question if i don't do it r rightly you may correct me so you are you are uh, fascinated by the possibility to make a better cooperation, to work out better cooperation between research on interpreting and research on translation phenomena. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Because given the fact we are now moving towards technology and you or yourself said, and we witness it in Brussels, of course, from a, where many countries are 
having a multilingual situation and a lot of uh, interpretations whether you call it relay or layers of relayed interpretations are going on wouldn't it be better to have a cooperation between translation and interpretation studies uh, my first answer is very short of course congratulations for the idea so this is very much needed of course all the areas and the sub areas in translation studies are uh, i would say they need they require some organization and organizations are splitting up people as well as uniting them so it's not simple so there should be something like an explicit organizational bridge between such units now i can show you that this has been worked out already and i would say to a certain extent via uh, translation studies uh, going back to homes and so on and i give you the names and these are the most experienced people and they were living and working with us so within my center cetra our center cetra we had at, we had at least two three very big people among the experts in interpreting and uh, our group started mainly on the basis of experts in translation methods and not in interpreting now <coughs> i make also a precise terminological uh, suggestion in a moment but we have experts excuse me <laughs> yeah there's some noise around but uh, i i can continue uh, two big experts three in our institute and they worked so my institute exists since 89 and it is since 92 or 3 that daniel gil Uh, I have sent uh, that article of his to you recently, but Daniel Gil, until 2022, takes part every year in our summer session. The goal of our summer sessions is to train researchers, not just in interpreting for him. He has a more general approach, so the bridge exists between. certain people and within certain people's brains and i even know an article uh, published by an expert in interpreting and translation training and so on so i i uh, sent that to you but but daniel zil had uh, i would say a young brother i would call him even also he's not big but a big brother Franz Pechacker Franz Pechacker and Franz Pechacker is also very mobile and it's, it's really an expert of very high level and these two people have been coming to our center and i can tell you it's not for money that they come so they do this they uh, one day said we come here in order to keep informed on the discipline but they work they all were, all these staff members come for one week in our institute so one of the suggestions i would like to make to you is uh, an initiation into that kind of approach to translation phenomena as i like to call them uh, such an initiation can uh, go to your students and they that's how they multiply your students will multiply together with you now what we can also do is uh, maybe showing how the our uh, new views on translation who have been i would say successful in matters of translation how they can work in interpreting studies Uh, so that's one thing but you need more than just the brains and the research of individuals 
you need some uh, institutional motivation and maybe people like Daniel Zil or Franz Pechater could help you there too. So for interpreting myself, uh, the, only, the only things I know a bit is uh, I, I have started up research about media translation, about dubbing. One, one of my students has been the first one uh, in Target to publish an article about the question of dubbing in, uh, of uh, norms in the, in the translation of uh, films by dubbing. Well, I would say these are my suggestions, but I'll uh, put that down uh, into an email for you. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, this is a never ending topic. And the moment you say, talk about dubbing, it uh, opens up another uh, interesting area of research, how speech gets translated. I, we are running out of time. Otherwise, I'm sure we would be able to continue. But uh, I could not stop myself by telling you a small uh, anecdote that happened in Tongren, in uh, your part of the world. When people started hearing my name, when I said my name is Uma, they would interpret it as Uma and call me as grandma. So I guess this kind of problems are also there when you talked about dubbing and speech uh, translation or interpretation. It opens uh, other uh, avenues for research. I just uh, wanted to share it with you. And uh, I think you, are, I mean, sorry, we have kept you for more than two hours. I admire your strength and your energy in doing this with us from 3 p.m. Indian time, you are with us. It's going to be, it's two hours and 10 minutes. So I think uh, before we close, I would like to know if uh, Professor Shailendra Mon, Shailendra, are you there? You want yeah. to say, yeah, can you say something? Yeah, thank you very much. On behalf of the Institute of Indian Languages, I thank Professor Jules Lambert for such an insightful lecture on translation, which is the future, uh, perhaps, especially in the context when we go ahead with machine translations, uh, systems which will have a problem of translating as well as interpretation and this insightful journey that the historical context that you placed for translation perhaps will help us in understanding the nuances when we go for a human translations with the machine translation systems and thank you very much sir for your insightful talk and thought provoking for making us believe about the interpretation especially that is a future challenge that we are going to face in this translation world. Thank you very much, sir, for your insightful talk. Yeah, thank you, Shalanga. So thank you once again, Jose. So it was lovely to have you with us. Yeah. And I must say thank you, merci beaucoup, obrigada. So okay. any, we will be in touch and we will continue this dialogue again. And like we told you earlier, uh, we are going to bring out publications of this series. I'll share the recording of this with you. Maybe it will help you to write down your paper. So thank you so much, everybody. On behalf of the CIL and on my own personal behalf, I thank all of you to be for being with us this evening. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you. I reciprocate my words and I'm honored by the opportunity to talk to so many people in such a different world. All the best to you. Thank you. I, I close here, but I'm happy with our experience. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. It was indeed a great honor for us. Thank you once again. Bye bye. Good bye. Night. Yeah. Bye. Thank you all of you. Hey. Yeah, okay. Hey. 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 Hey.